Good morning everyone, uh, welcome to Cardiff Business School, um, to our breakfast briefing. Um, lots of regular faces here, but lots of new ones too actually. Um, for those of you who don't know, our breakfast briefing series is designed to be little opportunities to come into the business school and see the wonderful work of our academics and the work of our partners. I'm delighted to welcome Daryl Mann here today. I um, can't remember when I first saw Daryl Mann speak, but it was part of a Lean Operations Masters. And he just blew me away in terms of my understanding of innovation and how much he knew about it. So I'm really looking forward to hearing um, <laughs> everything that you've got to say on this topic later. My name's Sarah Lethbridge. I'm the Director of Executive Education here at Cardiff Business School. Um, if you've got any company um, inquiries around training, executive education, please, you know who to call. Um, and I'm also the Director of our Executive MBA. So if you're interested in that programme, then again, please do get in touch. We're also um, lucky here to have the director of our new MSc in Public Leadership, Catherine Farrell. Would you mind doing a little wave, Catherine? <laughs> so if anyone wants to talk about the Public Leadership Programme, then please do see Catherine um, after this session, have a little chat about the programme over a coffee. Whoa, we've got a lot of events planned, guys. Um, hopefully you can come to some of them. Um, I'm going to be talking about our EMBA tomorrow at 9.30 through the internet, so let's see if that works, um, if anyone wants to tune in there. Um, really pleased to be working with Shamai to look at homelessness, very <coughs> critical issue that's obviously affecting not only lives but the city of Cardiff. Um, also, professional programme Choose and Wine Evening, and if you love what Daryl has to say in this hour and of it today, you can spend the whole day with him on uh, Monday the 29th of April. So again, if this um, intrigues you and you want to find out more and spend the day going through some of these ideas with Daryl, then please do let us know. Um, especially if you at water, it's Valley to Wales in May. And then Sarah Pepper. Oh, there you are. Um, we're planning a few events around Creative Cardiff and the exciting new fund that Sarah's team are bringing to Cardiff and the region. And then I think we're going to tackle the Metro project as well in July. Again, we're always looking for interesting ideas, so if you've got any ideas or would like to take part in our breakfast briefing series, do let me know. Just a little heads up that our breakfast briefing is being recorded and live streamed, so um, you can't see any of you from the camera, it would just be Daryl, but do you... <laughs> Do, do um, be sure, if you ask questions at the end, to wait for a microphone so that we can capture that on tape. And if you don't want to be on tape, or your voice be on tape, then it's probably better not to ask a question. <laughs> Just a little heads up there. Um, so now I'll hand over to Daryl, and he's going to share all his perspectives about innovation relating to particular insurance. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, it's nice to be in this country uh, for a change. I, used to, I spend uh, my life, it feels like, in permanent jet lag, so uh, uh, there's no such thing as early or late in that world. If the curtains are closed, it's night time. If they're open, it's, it's daytime. Um, so the, I've changed the title slightly, and I'm, I'm still not sure whether it's the right title. Um, so the, the, the theme is, is innovation, and we're going to be talking about what uh, I, I refer to as the Magnificent Seven in the context of the insurance industry. Um, I've got the word versus at the moment because uh, I think it could very easily go uh, in a direction that says that there is a battle coming here um, where the Magnificent Seven see an opportunity and decide to seize it. Um, of course inside every uh, threat is also an opportunity so it could uh, become a great win-win uh, for, for everybody and we'll perhaps have a think about that as we go through the, uh, the slides. Uh, I get to be the luckiest person on the planet, I think, in that uh, we get to work with a lot of organisations um, that are trying to innovate. I think the, uh, the only consistent message wherever I am, whichever industry we get to work in, is innovation is really difficult and we fail far more often than we are successful. And um, what, uh, what we've been trying to do for the last uh, 20 years now is take um, uh, innovation down to a first principle level, um, try and understand what, what happens and what's supposed to happen at that first principle level. And um, I think we've been able to do that, and that's what enables us to go to just about every different industry 
with a message that says, um, if we understand your industry at this first principle level, then we've got a good chance of being able to, uh, uh, to do the innovation job uh, without too much of the pain. Um, the, the crux of a lot of that innovation stuff, and certainly I think as far as uh, the insurance sector is concerned, but most of our insurance uh, clients happen to be in the United States for, for some reason, so people like Genworth and some of the credit union companies um, over there. Uh, I think almost every project that we've been involved in has had this uh, story right at its heart. And uh, I've reframed it here in terms of, the, I guess, the classic British restaurant uh, scene. Uh, so I think uh, I worked in 26 countries last year. So my, uh, uh, in my mind, the British food is the worst food on the planet. Um, um, but uh, um, nevertheless, we're still going to be asked at some point during our meal uh, whether we're enjoying ourselves uh, or not. And so here's uh, the classic customer survey, um, if you like. Um, but um, as with most customer surveys, utterly meaningless uh, unless you capture the right information. So the waiter comes along, and if you imagine last time you were at uh, some kind of a, a restaurant uh, event, at some point you are going to be interrupted uh, to ask how your meal has been. And uh, your job at that moment, and certainly the job of this diner here, is not to give honest feedback. The job is to get rid of the waiter as quickly as possible, uh, ideally without causing offence. So what's the simplest words I can communicate that will get rid of that person, enable me to continue with my, with my meal? And so usually something like fine thanks uh, is the, uh, the stock phrase that's going to come out. Now everybody's happy. The waiter's going to go away. And um, the waiter's happy because uh, he or she can go back to chef and put the thumbs up to chef. Yeah, you've done a good job, chef. The only meaningful information in this transaction, unfortunately, is the stuff that's not been said. It's the stuff that's been thought. Um, and so one of our very early engagements with a client, um, looking back, we've been really fortunate over the years, but working with Procter & Gamble in the States, uh, 2004, 2009, the heart of the problem was, unless we capture this stuff that's been thought and not said, then we've got no chance at all of being successful with our innovation attempt. Yeah. So how do we capture that stuff? And um, yeah, what, what it really boils down to when you take it down to a first principle level is it, it, uh, the veracity uh, word. Yeah. Am I hearing truth from uh, the person that I'm communicating with um, or not? Uh, now, sometimes yeah, uh, consumers, customers will deliberately game the system. If I go and ask them, they will deliberately point me in the wrong direction. Um, sometimes they will give me the answer that they think I want to hear. But in neither of those situations, gifting or gaming, have I come away with anything that's uh, actionable. Um, from an insurance perspective, I think the, the word that comes with this is truth. Um, if I could trust uh, the customer that when they say that their, uh, uh, their claim is a valid one, that it is a valid one, then that saved me an awful lot of hassle and uh, allows me to run my business effectively. When people apply for an insurance policy, are they honest in the information that they've given me there? Um, if they are, then um, I've got a meaningful chance of running a, a, a viable and long-term business. So how do we capture the stuff that's not being said? Uh, is, uh, is where we're trying to get to. So I could keep going back to, to this theme as we go through. Um, meanwhile, let's just step up, step back a little bit and just think about the innovation uh, word. So uh, I think it was 2007 we published this book. Um, so we'd been going for quite a while already and we had a lot of customers in the IT service sector in India uh, who were looking to um, leapfrog a lot of the uh, US and West solutions and so innovation was becoming a big topic there so we put together this book of uh, um, how to innovate in the in the IT world and um, it's, it turned out to be quite a different book to all the other ones that we've put together on the innovation subject and I think the reason for that is that the challenge uh, here when you look at this innovation world in the IT context um, that one of the predictions the books makes is that the, the geeks will inherit the earth um, that if you, if you own the data then uh, you get to be the person who decides yeah, the direction that the world goes in, basically. And I think what we're seeing uh, in the, the rise of social media and the Magnificent Seven, 
Um, I think that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much the truth already. Um, the other prediction in the book, uh, or statement, I should say, in the book, is that uh, the software, uh, those geeks that are responsible for writing the algorithms and the, and the code, are the least qualified people on the planet to take on that position of being leaders of the free, uh, free world. And um, I think that's also started to feel like it's, it's come true. If you look at uh, the, some of the naivety for, from Mark Zuckerberg and, uh, um, and Facebook in particular, then um, they really don't get it, I don't think, in terms of uh, um, their responsibilities uh, when they reach the size that they do. Um, so where does that uh, leave us? Um, well, I think what it does give us, certainly if you look at um, the big companies in the United States, the NASDAQ, um, then um, something uh, has happened in the recent uh, past that has been very, very nonlinear. Um, the, the big five uh, over there um, are enormous. Now, you know, come from zero to completely dominate their environment um, over there. It's basically the big five and everybody else. Yeah, um, how has that happened? Has that happened through great skill? Uh, well, in some respects, yes, but also I think what they're benefiting from is a massive virtuous cycle that occurs when you do own the data. Yeah, um, if you've got uh, you know, terabytes and terabytes of information coming into <coughs> uh, your algorithms on a daily basis, you get to learn really quickly. Um, and once you've trained your software to what to go and look for, then you learn even more quickly. So you set up a virtuous <coughs> circle inside the virtuous uh, circle. Um, yeah, the more data you get, the better you're able to design the next thing that's, in the case of Facebook, going to addict your customer to keep coming back to their uh, Facebook uh, account. Um, but th with the deep learning algorithms that are um, in place now, you very quickly get to a point where you understand what's going on um, really, really well. Uh, better than the customer themselves uh, understands what's going on. Uh, if you remember when Edward Snowden um, revealed himself, then um, the metadata never lies was his, his big thing. If you, if you can see the big picture, um, then um, uh, the way to evolve your business if you're a commercial organisation becomes very, very clear. And it certainly has done for that big five. But I think we can see it, we, we can see it everywhere these days. So uh, once you've trained a piece of software to go and, and analyze an x-ray, for example, and look for uh, cancerous cells or whatever it is you're looking for, um, then after about 100,000 data points, the software is better than the best radiologist at doing that job. Uh, um, if you look inside the insurance uh, sector, yeah, by the time you've got 100,000 data points, the algorithm um, that's looking for the potentially fraudulent customer, for example, is way better um, than the insurance agent. Uh, if you're looking for you know, loss adjustment, for example, the software does it better. And I think we can see evidence of that already in places like Japan, where uh, labor rates are very high, and along comes IBM Watson, um, and says, um, yeah, we can do this loss adjustment job better than you can, so let's, uh, let's, let's, let's demonstrate that for you. And again, what's, what happens as far as uh, Watson's concerned is it reinforces this virtuous cycle. Again, the more data I've got, the stronger I get to be, faster and faster and faster. Um, so what does, what does that do then in terms of uh, a bigger world? I think... Uh, for most people, I don't know about you personally, but uh, um, China wasn't really on my radar as far as artificial intelligence five years ago. Um, but uh, this book came out uh, last year. I don't know if anybody's read uh, this book, but uh, um, it's, it's got a, a few bits which are a little bit clunky, but uh, um, uh, quite a great, uh, quite a good call to arms, uh, I would say. And um, uh, Kai-Fu Li is the person who uh, was responsible for Google China before uh, Google left, well, effectively left uh, China. So he was there at the beginning, if you like. He's now there um, in Beijing as basically an investor. 
um, with a fund that uh, is uh, uh, starting up Chinese uh, indigenous uh, companies in the AI uh, sector. So his pronouncement here is basically the, um, the world's already pretty much settled in terms of the, the next generation of superpowers uh, when it comes to business, and it's Silicon Valley and it's China. Yeah, and this is where our Magnificent Seven um, ultimately comes from. I think if you read the book, um, then it's the, on one level it's the same basic message as, uh, uh, as my book from 2007. Uh, the geeks will inherit the earth. Um, if you own the data, you win. And uh, there's still the least qualified people to take on that responsibility uh, in society. Um, although I think if I think uh, Kaifu Lee personally, um, if you, you know, read his message, particularly towards the end of the book, um, I think he's a very uh, ethical and moral uh, person. So what can we take from this uh, this book here? Well, I think the two two really important start points as far as China's role in this artificial intelligence uh, world. Number one, when the premier stands up and declares to the public. Um, we're entering an age of mass entrepreneurship and mass innovation, then the way that gets acted upon inside uh, the Chinese world is everybody's now been given permission to innovate and to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, uh, and so you get um, a, a literally a boiling cauldron of um, young people who are now determined to become uh, entrepreneurs. And IT and writing apps is a really easy way into that world. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, artificial intelligence, yeah, that, that's, I think that's 2014, that, that comment, then uh, already some enormous players uh, in the AI world in China. And um, I think they've risen uh, to such great valuation so quickly because um, if you want to go to a place that's got lots of data, then China is in. Yeah, if you've got 1.4 billion uh, people inside your country, then that's an awful lot of data once you've connected people up to uh, your services. Um, second important point uh, is uh, um, what I've called a Chinese, China's Sputnik moment. So um, I don't know if you've, any of you have spent time in China, um, uh, know about Chinese culture, but Go uh, is a big part of that, of that culture. Um, if you're a smart person, then you play Go and you play it well. And so 2017, um, then uh, <coughs> DeepMind um, and uh, uh, AlphaGo uh, beat the world Go champion. And I think, again, that what that sends out is a message that says um, the AI has reached a certain level <coughs> now at which we cannot ignore this uh, anymore. This changes everything. So you've got um, a cauldron of uh, entrepreneurs being told to innovate, um, and you've been given the clear message that uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, is uh, really starting to change things. Now, what you add to that, then, I think, is um, another important element of the culture in China is massive, massive copying. Um, and copying there uh, is seen as a good thing rather than a bad thing. If somebody comes along and copies what you've done, then they are honouring you rather than trying to take away your intellectual uh, property. So um, you can pretty much uh, bet that for every Western brand, there is a Chinese ripoff of uh, that brand. And that's, that's what we tend to see over here uh, in the West. But if you're Alibaba uh, or Tencent or, or any of these, uh, these giants, then you're also living in this world. Yeah, the moment that, that Alibaba's website is set up, a week later, there are 10 other Alibaba copy websites coming along. Yeah, because everybody is going to be the next Alibaba. Yeah, um, and so um, if you're an innovator and one of these entrepreneurs in the Chinese environment in this culture, then you need to get really good really quickly. Because if you don't, you're going to be eaten up by somebody else. Yeah, um, and this, I think, is where China's got an enormous advantage over Silicon Valley. 
where what the Silicon Valley uh, big companies have done is basically segmented the market and said, okay, I'm going I'm to own this bit and I'm going to own this bit and let's not fight over this. You know, that doesn't happen uh, in China. Everybody's trying to get to that higher ground and uh, own the data because I, they, they understand very, very clearly if you do own the data, you win. So take that um, environment and then add in another enormous benefit that uh, China has got. So back to my veracity question for a second. How do I know whether somebody is telling me the truth or not? Well, if you look at a lot of the uh, uh, internet uh, services and social media in China, they're much more connected online to offline. So for example, um, Just Eat in this country, the equivalence of that in China uh, has been enormous business for about five years uh, now. People ordering stuff online, um, interacting, you know, having food delivered to their home, having ordered online. Um, then it is enormous. Um, and again, a difference from Silicon Valley where, um, because of the segmentation there, the online and the offline are, tend to be quite disconnected from one another. But really, the reason this is really important from a veracity perspective is it immediately eliminates this say-do uh, difference from consumers yeah, because what the, off, what the offline stuff tells you is actual behaviour. Yeah, you can go and interview customers and say, okay, do you want a pizza tonight or do you want a curry? And you can't really take much credence from the answer they've given you. But if they go on the app and they order pizza uh, and pizza arrives, then you've got actual data, yeah, meaningful data of this is what people did. And... Um, yeah, if you repeat that hundreds of millions of times a day, those online to offline transactions, then again, you get to learn what people are actually doing uh, very, very <coughs> quickly. So some of the implications of that, that's probably too much detail, but um, yeah, if you think about uh, financial services in, in general, then this is Tencent and, uh, and WeChat. And a part of this, uh, innovation <coughs> rate that's taking place over there says that um, yeah, this thing which is it, yeah, effectively starts out as a uh, um, an equivalent of Twitter or Instagram if you like, quickly becomes a high level platform um, from which you can pretty much live your whole life inside uh, China including these days um, getting a loan. <coughs> so um, banks not fast enough, um, along comes WeChat and says well yeah if you want a loan um, then we can organise uh, that for you, up to £30,000 uh, the size of that loan at the moment. And um, the reason they can do that and operate that as a already a very, very successful business <coughs> is again, you own all the data from the person who's come along asking for the loan. And you can very tr quickly train algorithms to detect, is this person going <coughs> to repay this loan or are they uh, not going to repay the loan? Um, you've got all the data and you just put your learning engine and all that data and say find correlations for me. <coughs> yeah. the, here's a person historically who did not pay a loan, look at all their characteristics. Here's a person who did pay uh, their loan back, look at their characteristics. What are the differences between the two? So for example, one of the things that comes out of that is um, the amount of uh, power that's left in your battery on your smartphone when you apply for the loan is strongly correlated to whether you're gonna pay your loan back or not. Yeah, um, yeah the data was there, it just needed somebody, something to connect the dots and say, actually that is correlated to, to the stuff that I'm interested um, in. Um, Another one that is kind of a little bit uh, weird, but when you think about it, it actually makes uh, sense. How quickly, so when you're applying for your, your loan, how quickly did you type in your date of birth? Uh, the speed at which you did that also is correlated to whether you're going to pay your loan back or not. Yeah. Uh, now, you take that and multiply that by thousands and thousands. Literally, look at all of the uh, attributes of the people that are communicating with your system in every walk of their life. And again, you learn very, very quickly, you know, this is what a trustworthy person looks like. Yeah. And you've done it in the real world because it's the online to offline uh, world that you're uh, looking at. And what's happening here is uh, WeChat and, and Tencent completely bypasses the whole banking system. Yeah. All the banking system can do is just sit and watch this. Yeah. And more and more of the business gets taken away. 
And in many ways, that's what the, the Magnificent Seven are looking for. If they look at all the industries that are really bad at innovation, because the core strength of those organisations now in the Magnificent Seven is they're really good at innovation, because their world changes really, really quickly. So who's really bad at it? Yeah, well, um, as you look around different industries, you say, okay, well, education, they're really bad at innovation. Yeah, healthcare, really bad at innovation. Financial services, really bad at innovation. Automotive, really bad at innovation. We'll strip the value from all those industries. Before they wake up, then we'll literally have stripped the value from those, those sectors. Um, and yeah, it it's starts from this kind of thing. You own the data, you win, uh, basically. Now, um, talking about veracity, that whole story, um, in perhaps a rather dystopian way, um, culminates in some kind of a social credit system. Uh, and I don't know if you've encountered the social credit system in China. It's still at its formative uh, <coughs> point. But um, if you aggregate all of this data about whether somebody's trustworthy um, or not, then you get to build uh, the societal algorithm that says, yeah, this person is not a trustworthy person. And so um, in order to encourage people to be better citizens, um, if your social credit rating um, is low, then you don't get access to buy train tickets, for example. Um, and uh, you set up what could rapidly become um, a very, very self-correcting system where people know how to behave correctly. Um, now, that's really open to exploitation, um, I think, and it's still really early days in terms of how that uh, pans out. In the West, we've effectively got the same thing. If you're an eBay customer, then uh, your feedback rating is you voluntarily uh, demonstrating to the world that you're a trustworthy person um, or not. You know, all this does is because of people like Tencent and Baidu um, are aggregating all the data, you get to build this picture and uh, uh, you get to connect, uh, I say, all of the, all of the dots. Uh, we'll worry about the morality of that later on, I think, whether we like it or not, um, whether it's the state that does it in this case, or whether it's Silicon Valley that does it, um, then the data is effectively already there to, um, to calculate this for, for all of us. Okay, let's have a thing about innovation uh, for a second. But, uh, uh, the message so far, I think, is that uh, those companies that own the data have already won. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for them, it's a case of um, which of those industries that are, are, that are bad at innovation do I go and uh, strip the value from next. Um, let's try and make it rather more uh, positive and see if there's a, um, another side to this story. Um, this is more my day-to-day -day world. This is uh, um, organisations, um, I think all these are Western companies, so each of those blue dots is a company. And uh, how good are we at the innovation job? Uh, so this picture here basically says not very good. Um, so the, um, the model here says, let's have a look at how much organizations are spending on R&D. That's the horizontal axis on the picture. And the vertical axis is what was the impact of that. Um, so we spent money on innovation type stuff. Uh, did the company grow? Did the company shrink? Um, in fairness to the compilers of this data, uh, what they have done is they've realised that there is a lag between the money that I spend on research and when I'm able to monetize uh, that uh, spend. So it compensates uh, for that. But um, it's probably too early in the morning to be doing regression analysis. But if I ask you to draw the average through those blue dots, um, I think the only sensible answer you can give me is that the average is exactly uh, that origin line. Yeah, um, it's a line parallel to that origin line, which basically says, on average, um, it doesn't matter how much you spend on R&D stuff, um, it's going to have no impact on your business at all. Okay, now, if you're a CEO or a CFO and you look at data like that, um, I think the, the most obvious conclusion is avoid innovation if you possibly can, because it's a mugs game. Uh, from my perspective, um, we have to treat data like this uh, somewhat differently. When you're in innovation world, the average is rarely of any value to you at all. You don't learn anything from the average. You only learn stuff when you go to the outliers and the extremes. And so our question when we see data like this is, what did the people at the top of the picture do? 
that the people at the bottom of the picture did not do, and vice versa. Am I looking at randomness here, or is the methodology behind those organisations that do the innovation job uh, well? And fortunately, when you ask that question, there are very clear things that the apples of the world um, do. In their case, I'd have to say used to do, because I think they've, uh, they've lost the plot in the last couple of years. But um, yeah, look at the success stories, try and reverse engineer what did the successful organisations do. And I say, fortunately, there is a pattern. Um, probably even less appropriate this time of the morning to be um, thinking about mathematical analysis of uh, discontinuous change, but um, a lot of the innovation story boils down to uh, S-curves and this idea of discontinuous change. And uh, the idea behind these curves is somebody invented something. Uh, so if you imagine on the bottom left corner, Alexander Graham Bell invents a telephone, for example. And um, I've not labelled the vertical axis, but that's anything that we're trying to improve in our <coughs> business. So if in the insurance sector, repayment, um, uh, rates, for example, profitability of the business, whatever it is, I'm, I'm running the business on the, the metrics that I'm using. Um, if it's Alexander Graham Bell, it's the number of people who've got a telephone, uh, for example. <coughs> and the S curve says that after an, an initial period of struggle, so time is the horizontal axis, then things really start to take off. Um, lots of people want a telephone. Um, and then things begin to plateau. Yeah. Um, Maybe because I've given everyone on the, on the planet a telephone, <coughs> but in the case of landline phones, it's the amount of copper that I've got to lay across the countryside. Yeah, if I want to connect everybody to everybody else, I need lots of copper to do that. Um, and so innovation is when somebody comes along and says, maybe let's invent the mobile phone. Let's have a cellular system where we, we can avoid that uh, contradiction. Um, but very often things get worse. So the start of my second curve things get worse than they were at the top of the, the old curve. If you remember when the first mobile phones appeared on the market, um, for most people, they were worse. Yeah, um, they were big, heavy things. They cost $25,000 uh, to own one. The battery was the size of a suitcase. Uh, but they served a purpose, and they get to climb <coughs> their S-curve. And as a result of that, then uh, for most people these days, I guess there's a decision coming up which says, do I need a landline phone at all right now? Yeah, does the cellular solution give me everything that I want? So the reason for showing you this, this picture is that the important thing as far as innovation is concerned in just about any industry is what I would call the pulse rate. Um, so um, how quickly are these jumps taking place from one uh, S-curve to the next uh, S-curve? And uh, um, here's where I think the Magnificent Seven uh, really understands some of it perhaps most organisations don't. So in terms of things like consumer electronics, uh, for example, which is relatively fast moving, if you're a Samsung, uh, for example, then you'd expect to have a step change every six to eight months. These days, if you're in the automotive world, three to five years. Uh, if you're in mining, <coughs> about 30 years. Um, if you're in the IT world, then uh, it's measurable in, in months. And uh, if you're measuring IT in the Chinese context, then you're pretty much talking about weeks. Those pulse rates are happening. Yeah, I'm going to change my algorithm literally from moment to moment. And some of those jumps that I'll make will be quite significant uh, jumps. So if you're making jumps all the time, then you're going to get, become really good at it, <coughs> is the basic idea. Um, now, uh, let's uh, come back to reality for a second. Uh, on average, you lose your money. Um, what that means uh, right now is that 98% of all innovation attempts end in failure. Uh, and uh, again, I think it's a fairly depressing picture, um, unless you say to yourself, maybe let's go and look at what the 2% <coughs> did and try and decode what the 2% um, did. I use this picture too many times uh, now, but uh, perhaps some of you haven't seen it before. Here's, here's an invention. Um, and Kind of the point of this slide is it's, it's easy to invent, it's difficult to innovate. And the difference between the two is if I'm inventing, I just submit a patent um, and hopefully get a patent uh, granted to me. Um, if I'm innovating, I'm actually going to make s some money and uh, create value in society. So, any ideas what this invention is? For those people that haven't seen it before. <coughs> Uh, it is, it is uh, yes, so it's, it's a medical device, um, 
uh, patients, patients sat on the table uh, there, and uh, it's always a woman, and uh, she's about to give birth. So that's an invention for a birthing table. So any ideas how this birthing table is going to help mum deliver baby? It's going to spin around. It is going to spin around, absolutely. Here's a centrifugal birthing machine. So it's going to <laughs> rotate at about 200 RPM. And, uh, that will definitely get baby out of mum. And the, the final stroke of genius here is this net, which is going to catch the baby as the baby is <laughs> centrifuged into the world. Um, the world is full of this kind of uh, solution. Um, yeah, ninety-eight percent of innovation attempts uh, fail. I'll just try and find the what did the two percent uh, do. So back to this veracity um, thing, connected up to the innovation story. Um, how do I get truth? Well, number one, I, as China is, uh, I think, demonstrating to us, I get lots of O2O, online to offline uh, data. Um, second option is that we start reading between the lines. I'll show you a little bit of that. But the third thing is this, let's get down to first principles. Let's understand what the 2% of people did um, that were successful. So that inevitably, I think, takes us into the world of uh, uh, complexity and understanding complex systems. So for every complex problem, uh, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and, and wrong. There's the aphorism that uh, most people have heard uh, in the context of complexity. Um, as soon as you go into a complex environment, then um, a number of the assumptions that I think we've all been taught in school, college, become largely irrelevant. Um, so for example, root cause analysis. Um, I'll often go to uh, businesses where um, there's a whole army of people who've been taught root cause analysis. And that's great until at such times as you find yourself in a complex environment, um, in which case it's uh, completely the wrong strategy. There is no such thing as a root cause in any kind of complex system. Uh, so any attempt to go and find it is a waste of effort. Um, the butterfly effect, tiny, tiny effects uh, can very quickly magnify and become um, enormous impacts uh, on your system. So there's no such thing as Pareto analysis uh, in the complex environment. You need to be looking at all the weak signals. And again, that's why the data is so important. Uh, here, um, knowing what to look for and looking for those uh, uh, weak signals. So I think um, what we're seeing is that um, we can expand that aphorism from make a very big complex problem. Uh, there are thousands of clear, simple, wrong answers. Uh, but there is also the, the opportunity of a clear, simple, right one um, if we understand what's going on at the first principle level. So let me just try and demonstrate that a little bit. Um, this is uh, a murmuration of Stalin's. If you, um, if you go out to the car park afterwards, you'll recognise my car because it's the one that's covered in Stalin droppings at the moment because the Stalings in uh, North Devon are living in my garden um, at the moment. Uh, but these formations are you know, remarkable. Uh, things. Um, there's no command and control here. Uh, if you understand what's happening in this system at the first principle level, every one of those birds has got that very simple instruction in their heads. Fly as close to your neighbour as possible. Yeah, and the behaviour of the system is then emergent uh, from that, that very basic idea. So um, reduce innovation down to first principles level and look at the 2% that were successful versus the 98% that were not successful. And the 2%, first of all, had a very clear understanding of what value was. Yeah, and value as defined by the customer. Um, and that red text there is the value equation that uh, uh, we tend to use. So it's the good stuff divided by the bad stuff. Yeah, what are the benefits that the customer gets out of the, the system? And what's all the negative stuff that goes with it? Yeah, how much do I have to pay for my insurance um, policy, for example? Are there any negative consequences that come uh, with it? Any environmental impact, any social impact um, that I can put in the negative side of the story? So if I want to be successful, then uh, the very clear uh, sign is increased value. Give the customer more good stuff, less bad stuff. And if there's a direction of success, then uh, there's also a destination of that success, uh, which we'll call ideal final result. And that's the point where the customer gets all the good stuff and none of the bad stuff. 
everything evolves towards free perfect and now. Now, I can't, I can't use that expression with most of the clients that we work with because the idea of free anything makes no sense in our current business model. Um, if you look at the Magnificent Seven, that is precisely the business model of all of them. Yeah. Most customers of those seven organisations will never give them any tangible money at all. Yeah, they've given them lots of value, but they've given them no tangible uh, value. Uh, um, so whether we like it or not, it is an inevitable endpoint, and the smart companies are the ones that recognise my business needs to be designed around that philosophy. So what are the solutions that goes with that? If you, again, if you look at the 2% of people that have been successful, uh, the word self at the bottom is a really important clue. Uh, what that means is whenever I'm designing something, um, I should be thinking about that word self. The software should update itself. The algorithm should train itself. The team should manage itself. The window should clean themselves. <coughs> yeah, they all tend to be uh, good solutions. Let's take that one step further. Um, so everything is all perfect. So let's just do um, the only two minutes of market research that would ever be useful, I think, from the perspective of insurance innovation. Um, what would the perfect insurance policy look like and how would it behave? What would your perfect insurance look like? Unlimited and free. Unlimited and free. <laughs> okay, anything else? Me. Upgrades you. Okay. So it recognises yeah. any change in your life circumstances automatically up change itself. Yep, nice. <coughs> when I write? When I write? When I write? Yes. What so does that mean? So I write the insurance policy. Okay, so you're going to write it. Okay, the customer writes the policy. Yeah. Fantastic, nice. Invisible. Invisible. Okay. What's that mean? Well, um, I break my car and you go in there seamlessly that I don't even notice how. Okay. Okay. I don't even know it's there. Yeah. The only moment I begin to realise it's there is I, I hit, I crash the car, and my phone rings. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Anything else? Okay, I've always got the best deal. No effort on my part, I've always got the best deal. Anything else? Covers me for anything. Anything. So I've got a separate travel, house, car. Okay. Any situation I'm in. Yeah, it knows exactly what I'm doing right now and what I need to be protected for and against. Okay, one more maybe? Anything else? Clear? So completely transparent. <coughs> yeah. Nice. Okay. So when I s so Yeah, if I need it to claim on my policy, it's easy to do. Yeah, so what what's the perfect version of easy? As easy as possible. Okay. The money turns up in the bank, right? Yeah, yeah the replacement car <coughs> arrives on the drive tomorrow morning. Lifelong no claims. Lifelong no claims, fantastic, it's easy now, right? Um, not great if you work in the insurance sector, um, but defining what the end goal is, as far as the customer's concerned, is really easy. And I propose, the reason I catch this in terms of this is the only market research that would ever be useful, um, I was putting it in an innovation uh, context. What we found there, I think, are two uh, different strategies. And as far as we can see, there are only two ways to innovate. Uh, way number one is you add a function that isn't currently there okay and the other one is you solve com some kind of a contradiction so this whole idea of flexibility and invisibility and transparency um, all are around about contradictions you know there are lots of reasons why the insurance companies cannot do those things some of which are regulatory um, but a lot of them are um, the business models that uh, currently exist there so a model for innovation that I think you'll see in the 2% of companies that are successful is something that looks like this. Um, the mouse is the innovator. Yeah, the mouse is trying to get to the cheese. The cheese is the perfect solution. So make sure you know where perfect is. You may well never get there in, in reality, but at least know where it is. 
Um, and the walls in the maze are all of the barriers that stand between you today and that ideal solution. Right, now, um, uh, what we're seeing here is a model um, that's, um, if you take it to its nth degree, um, basically uh, says, go and look for the contradictions. So when you're reading um, narrative data from consumers, uh, for example, to try and understand their behaviour, um, look for things like contradictions. Um, here's my version of that, uh, that mouse trying to get to the cheese picture. Um, it's, it's not nearly as interesting, but I think it does say something that the, the cheese picture perhaps doesn't do. Um, everything heads towards an ideal solution. Okay, and if we define what the ideal insurance uh, uh, looks like uh, and is, then by definition that is a point on the right-hand side of the picture. Um, and the fact that it's a point means that the whole innovation story is a convergent one. So all those players that are offering insurance products and services, uh, whether it's the insurer, the broker, or uh, Tencent, Baidu, and any of the other magnificent seven companies, they've got to move left to right across the picture more benefits, less cost, uh, less harm. But because it's convergent, they can't all win. Yeah, um, and yeah, strategically drawing that picture <laughs> for your organisation, whatever industry uh, you're in, I think is an important thing um, to do. It requires quite a bit of bravery, um, I would say, but it's an important thing to know uh, in terms of who are the winners. So the one I jumped over for a second, this is what an exercise that we do quite a lot in terms of the lawnmower business. Um, so if I'm a lawnmower designer and manufacturer, um, it's incumbent upon me to make a better and better lawnmower. But ultimately the customer on the right hand side just wants short grass. Yeah, they don't want a lawnmower at all. Um, and so whether it's the AstroTurf business or the garden tools business or the company that makes the grass seed, um, if I extrapolate along all of those um, different players in the industry, I think the winner is inevitable. Yeah, only one of those companies can make it all the way to the end of the story, right? And who's the inevitable winner? Yeah, you modify grass. Well, not necessarily to modify, because that's, I think that's, there's a contradiction, but it's got to be the grassy player, right? Because they're the only ones that can control how high this thing's going to grow in your, um, in your garden. The winner's inevitable. Um, that grass seed has been invented. Um, you can't go and buy it. Um, but it's been invented. You can go and look at the patents for it, the whole family patents for it these days. Um, really, you can't go and buy it. Is when you look at the um, the owner of those patents, it's basically the lawnmower companies, because <laughs> they've understood that um, the future I in my industry is not my current way of doing things. Yeah, and so my insurance policy is to own the IP on the thing that's going to come along and disrupt me, and at the very least, that will buy me 17 years. Uh, to work out if and how I'm going to transition my business. Okay, one final thing. Here's the worst slide ever, I think. Um, um, but this is what happens when you do start to read between the lines. So we, um, like a lot of uh, the magnificent seven companies, suck in a lot of social media uh, data, but use it quite differently. Um, one of the things that we're looking for are contradictions. So when the consumer says, oh, I'd love this, but this, <coughs> you know you found something interesting. Um, and so this tool is called a contradiction matrix. It's, uh, um, I'm not going to do it justice uh, right now, but the basic idea behind it is think about anything that you're trying to improve <coughs> inside your business. So if you're an insurance company, for example, um, I, I'd love to innovate. Um, and you know, I find something on my menu that says, yeah, I'm not the only person who's had to try and improve innovation capability before. Now what's stopping me? So the top of the matrix says, okay, why can't you do it? And a uh, horrible paradox for the whole finance sector, I think, is uh, lack of trust from customers, um, global financial crisis, uh, etc. cetera. So um, I'm, there's an expectation on the part of customers that are gonna be really, really stable. So how do I innovate and also appear to be very, very stable and safe uh, with your money? Well, according to the tool, yeah, we're not the only people in the world who've had that problem. Uh, before the job of my research team is to go and collate all those people that have already been there and solve those problems and come back to the uh, organisations that are <coughs> trying to solve the contradictions. Like, well, these are the strategies that other people used. So maybe as a first bet, we can uh, deploy those strategies inside our sector and see where they take us. <coughs> Someone somewhere solved your problem is the basic message 
uh, from this kind of tool. Um, there's the automated version of it. So just you know, let uh, um, a year's worth of Twitter feeds, for example, for an insurance company, and I can pick out all the contradictions that you can hear customers talking about, and you know which are the walls in the maze um, that you need to go and knock down. One more final thing. Let's uh, just do uh, one quick thing first. Principles trying to understand uh, customers. The customer uh, is looking for the benefit, uh, trying to get a job done. And I think where the Silicon Valley companies um, really uh, saw their big success was in recognizing that a lot of those things that the customer are looking for are quite intangible and difficult to measure. So trust being you know, one of those uh, things. So um, when Apple still knew how to innovate, um, the designers understood this model uh, here. You, you try and understand the, cons the consumer in their case from the perspective of what are the tangibles they're looking for, what are the intangibles they're looking for, what are the people around them want. So the individual customer and the people around them, what do they want? So if you look at the success of Uber, uh, for example, um, it's really a recognition that when it comes to that intangible side of the story, um, most industries don't even think about it. And the reason they don't think about it is it's very difficult to measure it traditionally. Yeah. Um, how much does my customer trust me? Yeah. Um, how reliable uh, is the, the customer? Um, <coughs> if I ask pretty much any taxi driver in this country, what are the intangibles that you're, you're giving me? They'd have no idea what I'm talking about. And that's another important clue um, here. But the success of Uber, I propose, I mean, on the, on the left-hand side, yeah, they save me a little bit of money, but the main reason um, they've been so successful so quickly is they've understood right down at first principles level, customers want to be in control of the situation. Yeah. When you get into a normal taxi, the door closes. Um, I was in London the other day. The door closes, but not only does it close, but the door click, the, you hear a click. And that click is a signal the driver's now locked the door. I'm now totally not in control of this transaction. Yeah. And Uber says, no, no, customers want to be in control. No market research required to understand that. Put the customer in control. Before you get into the car, you've agreed the price, you know who's coming, uh, you know yeah, where you're going. Um, you can ultimate sanction at the end of the, of the journey, you get to decide uh, the feedback on the driver. Yeah. Um, those intangibles um, pretty much boil down to, as far as Apple are concerned, three things. Um, autonomy, belonging, competence. And it's the, the human equivalent of the Starling murmuration, uh, if you like. We all want to be in control. We all want to belong to something. Um, um, so for a long time here, Apple, the cool tribe. And we all want to feel competent. Okay. So the innovation rule is really, really simple. Uh, if you want to be the 2% of people that are successful, A gets better, B gets better, C gets better. Yeah. Is the owner of this policy uh, feeling like they're in control? Do they feel like they belong to something? And have I made them feel competent? And uh, think about my insurance situation at home, I would say at least two of those scores, I'm, I'm in the negative band. I'm not in control of the process and I don't feel competent. Yeah. And as a consequence of that, the first insurer that comes along and says to me, Daryl, you're in control. Here's, the, here's what you're now belonging to and here's how competent you are. Then that's where I'm gonna sign up. Again, no market research required. A gets better, B gets better, C gets better is the rule, not just in the insurance industry, but in any um, industry. Um, and we couldn't do it at Apple, um, but there's a fourth part to that story, just uh, finally, which is meaning. We all like to do stuff which is meaningful. And uh, that's proving to be quite a dangerous one as well, also, when we've, we take some of these measurement tools inside organisations and, and measure A, B, C, and also M. Um, so this is one we did with, uh, with Just Eat. I'm not sure how clear that is, but uh, this is looking at the transaction, the journey that the customer goes through when they're ordering uh, through Just Eat. And as soon as you know that A, B, C is getting worse, there's your innovation uh, opportunity. So this is li literally just tracking social media uh, data and tagging it to different stages of the journey. Uh, the yellow line, which is kind of hidden, uh, there is the meaning line. And the bad news for Just Eat is that uh, throughout the transaction, there's a, an underlying guilt on the part of the customer that says, um, <coughs> I may be telling my kids that they're ordering out tonight as a treat, but actually I've just abdicated the most meaningful part of the day for most families. 
Yeah. Um, so they're failing on that end part of the story at the moment. But I say the, the DNA is, I think, there and quite clear. A gets better, B gets better, C gets better, and uh, uh, M should get better as well. So um, final uh, slide, I think uh, um, that's, that's one of the magnificent seven. Um, I think uh, Bill Gates understood S-curves in that quote. Yeah, there, things um, don't feel like they're changing very much at, be at the beginning, but then when the non-linearities of the S-curve kick in, uh, I mostly <coughs> underestimate uh, things. Um, if there's a way of beating the Magnificent uh, Seven, I think it is getting down to those princ first principle levels. Uh, if you've got 1.4 billion people in your country and you've got a 98% failure rate, that's still a lot of success stories. Um, yeah. If you live in a country that's got a 20 of, of that population, then you need to be much smarter about things, uh, I think. So understand things at the first principle level. Um, I think there's a very clear message from the from all the Magnificent Seven, if you own the data, you win. Um, and you win because it enables you to innovate much faster. Yeah, the pulse rate of the financial services sector, um, it makes them very, very vulnerable. Um, the opportunity there as well, uh, but very vulnerable. So with that, um, Sarah, thanks very much for the invitation. And thanks for your patience listening. And Thank you. Uh, talked about the uh, belonging competence and um, autonomy. autonomy yeah uh, do you get a sense with the with the people that are doing the uh, the algorithms and the innovation that with the sense that if, if you if you take the innovation and that, that and, and extrapolate it over, over the number of years yeah. will there not be a point where we're not competent in anything because it's been taken <laughs> over. So you know, we can't even we can't even use the lawnmower anymore because we don't need to. You know, the yeah. we don't need to read a book because it gets it gets implanted, and mm. we lose that sense of confidence and we lose that sense of purpose in, in yeah. what we're doing. Is there is there a point where there's a critical mass where they, they get pushed back? I, I think it's already happening um, to some extent. I think if you look at uh, people's behaviour when it comes to things like hobbies, then a, a lot of those are, are that return to. Um, doing things by hand, yeah. So, getting an allotment, for example, really, really, really big. Books go to book clubs. Uh, I think that contradiction is becoming very vivid. Of um, yeah, social media is making me utterly incompetent. <coughs> as soon as I personally register that fact, I go and do something about it. I think, and I think yeah, we all reach that kind of crisis moment where we say, I'm now utterly incompetent. Um, <laughs> what am I going to do right now? Do I just knuckle under and, and say, okay, well, I give in? Or do I fight it? Um, I think. Do you, see that, do you see that pushback in China, or was it a more a cultural thing? Um, I think that's still uh, what I see, um, and we we use some of our tools to track things like ABC in um, their social media. Is uh, still at a stage where um, uh, I've got nothing to lose, and so I'm going to do whatever's required to make my money. And I think it's still very much money uh, driven. Um, I suspect it's going to be another five years before there's that comeback that says, I am utterly incompetent and I need to do something about it. I guess this is a follow on from that question. Mm. Is there a connection between intelligence and consciousness? Intelligence and consciousness. I hope because so. If they develop consciousness, then yeah. they answer those questions. But if they do that, that's also even more scary than. than yeah, the I, th it, I think it is. I mean, I think um, uh, without sounding too dystopian about these things. So one of the things that all of our research on contradictions, for example, that horrible table I showed you, basically says is that um, there aren't that many problems in the world. Actually, if you brought it down to contradictions. Um, if you look at the strategies that are available to us to solve those contradictions, then right now it's 40. Uh, now, from a computer programmer perspective, if you say to me there are only 40 ways to solve any problem, that's very codable. 
Um, so we've got an experiment in house at the moment called Alexa, uh, uh, our own uh, version of that. But it's basically going to get the computer to invent. Uh, well, I, yes, I can get it to invent. Um, whether it's conscious yet, yeah, whether whether we understand actually what we mean by consciousness, I'm not sure. Uh, but if the if the last human act is the act of creativity, the computer is demonstrating to us, I can do that job for you. This is my face. Scary. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, it, it's, it is Any scary. other questions, please? That's shut people up. <laughs> Fascinating stuff, thank you. Uh, how profitable are the Magnitons 7 and for how long have they been profitable? Do we know? Uh, I, I think the, I think for me, you've got to separate the Silicon Valley companies from the, the China contingent. Um, Can you tell us more about those two? <laughs> but, yeah, so the BAT, so, uh, Baidu, Tencent and uh, Alibaba. Um, I think because they've connected the dots. So in other words, so my example of WeChat, I think is a great example of, you know, here's a, an environment, so it starts out as a basically simple app, but it becomes a meta app. It means I can live inside that, that app and do everything I want to do from inside that app. Um, that gives them much greater sustainability in terms of the business model. Um, I think Silicon Valley is really struggling now from the fact that they, they have segmented uh, the sector. Um, and so I think, yeah, I could take some like Facebook right now. Um, uh, it, they're reaching a precipice where I think the consumers could e can increasingly say, I just don't trust you anymore. <coughs> I'm going to go and find another platform. And they could lose half their customers very, very quickly. So I think the, the Silicon Valley version of the model is very, very unstable um, in that regard. Um, and I think the, the DNA of that part of the world is making unicorns and once you've made your billion dollars what do I care actually whereas like China um, is saying no no I, I'm, I'm, I'm building for the future yeah, I mean, one of the things that I find very striking with, with Chinese companies versus western companies is um, I have difficulty with most western companies talking about a three year plan or a five year plan um, most of my Chinese clients have got 50 year 100 year plans Make me make this face, Daryl. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Oh, Manish, please. Daryl, how do you see the online to offline strategy, uh, especially, can help here the NHS in terms of understanding how hmm. to improve patient safety or how to reduce waiting time? Do you see the online to offline strategy has got a role there? Uh, I do, I do, and I, and I think um, yeah. When I when I say that the uh, the magnificent seven, I look look around and, and say, okay, which are the industries that are really bad at innovation? Then one of the prime targets is healthcare, uh, because it's enormously expensive. You know, very few countries can afford the healthcare system, um, and so there's a great incentive to innovate. Um, but if I if I look at you know, any of the magnificent seven. And I look at uh, the NHS and say, in an innovation battle between those two, who's going to win? <coughs> um, it's not a great contest, actually. And I, and I think um, what is going to happen, I mean, you, ultimately, you've got to work with the NHS. So I think <coughs> the, the smart strategy from an NHS perspective will be to find one of those organisations and say, uh, we need to partner up here um, and work together. Um, otherwise, what will happen is the uh, one of those big companies will come along and strip the value. Uh, <coughs> I mean, I've, I've lived that personally. I started my career in the aerospace um, industry. Um, so the last project was a helicopter, uh, the Merlin. And if you look at the selling price of that, of that helicopter, it's 10% Rolls Royce for the engines, it's 20% Augusta Western for the airframe, and the other 70% goes to IBM for the software. Yeah, when, I, when I look at that business model, I say, I can't be in the aerospace industry. Anymore. We've given we've given the value away <coughs> to the data um, owner, and I think it's in healthcare it's going to be exactly the same thing. So it, for the NHS, it's start to be able to innovate really really quickly, um, or partner with somebody that can. But inevitably, that data is going to be tapped into. I mean, I mean, Google knows more about you know, our 
personal health than, than my GP does, for example, already. One final question. Thank you. Thank you. Is it oversimplistic to compare one of your early slides where you had the Chinese government effectively giving permission to the yeah. population to, to, to put a vaccine in the other drug for those versus the increasing Western discussion about regulation of its section of the medical system? Yeah, I, it's, I, I mean, I've, they, I've had these discussions in China a lot between vertical and horizontal democracy because that's, that's the way they see the, the East versus West system is we've basically um, uh, given away our value to commercial organisations rather than government uh, bodies. Um, and so I think in that environment, the regulation actually becomes kind of nugatory. It's, it's meaningless. People vote with their feet. Um, yeah, if, if I, as a consumer, trust this particular software provider, then that's that's where my money goes. Um, and if it's if it's based overseas and it doesn't comply with local regulations, do I actually care about that? Um, so I think the the whole understanding of nation state uh, becomes quite bizarre in the Silicon Valley uh, dominated West. I think so. I think China kind of says with that, things like that social credit system. Uh, maybe I get the best of work both worlds here. Maybe I get the control that I want as a government. Um, and I've also got a population that believes um, that they've got a, um, a good lifestyle. Okay, well, thank you so much, Daryl. Yeah, thanks really for the invitation. Again, slightly spooked. But um, <laughs> <So, yeah. laughs> we need a breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like um, to spend the day with Daryl, then um, please see one of the exec ed team. We can sign you up for that programme. Um, but thanks ever so much. Pleasure. And, no, thanks um, for I think there's still opportunity for some tea, um, coffee. Um, talk to you briefly about your yeah, innovative yeah. ideas. And um, thanks for coming. Thank you.